Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thank you so much for listening. Hi, Tech Oki, Chris Zaragoza, and Jim Hart. Also, Marlon Thompson. Thanks to all of you. On this episode of DTNS, OpenAI shows that AI is definitely big business now. LG says, Onyongigaseo to its scrollable living room TV. And Patrick Norton celebrates the first new capacity for a two and a half inch drive in six years. And we ask him, what's going on with storage these days? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, May 17th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. At the edge of the 314, I'm Patrick Norton. Drawing the top tech stories in Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh my gosh, what an all-star cast. I could not figure a better way to spend the Friday talking tech news than these folks right here. Let's start with the quick hits. Samsung announced it has made its Relumino mode available on the Galaxy S24. The mode was previously only available on Samsung TVs. Relumino mode is an accessibility feature that enhances contrast color and sharpness to make images more clear for people with low vision. The Wall Street Journal reports that Microsoft will allow Call of Duty for Xbox Game Pass subscription service during an Xbox showcase June 9th. Call of Duty is one of Activision's biggest revenue generators, and some think it could make less money if it's included in a subscription like that. So it's quite possible it will cost extra to get Call of Duty in Game Pass, or Microsoft might raise the price of the subscription overall. While we're talking about Microsoft events, don't forget Microsoft Build is next week, and Microsoft is holding a special event on Monday, May 20th, where they are expected to talk a lot about their AI strategy, because that's what everybody does these days at their developer conferences, and also show off new Windows Surface devices running on Qualcomm's Snapdragon Elite chipset. Singapore's Huber Butchery has become the first retailer to sell lab-grown meat derived from cultivating animal cells. The retailer's product was made in partnership with Good Meat, which is part of the U.S.-based Just Eat. If you head to Huber Butchery, look for the chicken-like Good Meat Three, but be advised, it's only three percent animal cells. The rest is a more typical plant-based protein. But hey, we're getting there. It's selling for seven Singapore dollars a pound, or about five U.S. dollars. That's how they used to get me to, to eat my vegetables. They just put three percent in my food. And then, yeah, uh, yeah. Tom, your peas are three percent meat. Eat them. <laughs> Twitter has been called X for a while now, but the Twitter.com domain remained in most of its URLs. So you could sort of get away with saying, well, it's called Twitter in some places. Not anymore. Site has made the transition to make X.com its fundamental domain name. So if you type Twitter.com now, it will redirect in all core URLs to a version with X.com. The last Major reference to Twitter is now gone. Sorry, if you want to be accurate, you need to call it X. But you don't have to be accurate. <laughs> just, just us. So call it whatever you want. <laughs> Sony Music sent a letter to more than 700 tech companies warning them not to use their music for training, development, or commercialization of AI systems without Sony's permission. This is a necessary step if Sony wants to negotiate rights deals with these companies going forward. As an example, YouTube came up, uh, came to an agreement with major music companies for a strict set of rules regarding the use of AI voices for music. As a result, YouTube has a product now called Dream Track, which lets users generate songs in the style of a limited number of artists from text prompts. Ah, sounds like Sony wants a deal. Maybe a license or something. Uh, speaking of which, we have prepared open AI news for you three ways today. Deals, features, and failures. Let's start with the deals. Reddit signed a deal to give open AI access to its API of real-time posts. So as you post things on Reddit, they can show up in open AI. Uh, and Reddit will use some of OpenAI's tech to add features for Redditors, some assistance in moderation and writing posts, et cetera. However, I think a lot of people are, you know, maybe not reading past the headline and, and jumping to a conclusion here. Reddit is not licensing its data for OpenAI for training its large language models. That is not happening. It's just saying, hey, you can access on the fly our real-time stuff. So if you want to refer to something, right, your LLM says, oh, let's look for this result. You find it on the web and include it. You can do that. Uh, Reddit did give Google a license to train off of Reddit data back in February. So 
That is your posts being used to train a large language model, but in that case, it's Gemini. Google also got access to the real-time API, same as OpenAI is getting. And in that deal, Reddit got access to Google's Vertex API, which helps Reddit improve its search. Uh, so my takeaways on this are not all improvements to open AI products need to be training data, apparently. Uh, and real-time info is a weakness. You know, the the whole joke of as a large language model, I'm two years out of date. Uh, you know, having real-time uh, Reddit info is, is probably a good deal, don't you think, Patrick? I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh, so did Google pay for exclusive rights? Is there now going to be a rights battle as people look for large collections? Oh, on the training data part of that. Yeah, that's interesting. Right. Well, if you think about it, there's been so many places that are that are laying down the law. For example, Sony with lyrics. There's been newspapers and other organizations that are like, you can't use our data for training, which may be because they don't want it in the LLMs or because they are preparing to negotiate for that. But it's like now I'm envisioning, you know, Google and OpenAI and everybody else battling to see who's going to get the best collection of natural language. Although I might argue that you know, while I love much of the language on Reddit, I'm not entirely sure so many Reddit inside jokes would be natural, but I look forward <laughs> to seeing LLMs being twisted by them. Well, and I think that's probably something, you know, we should make uh, clear because this was, I had a lot of folks asking me about this over the last 24 hours or so since this news dropped. Having Reddit giving OpenAI access to its API of real-time posts, different than training open AI's large language models, but how are they different? Yeah, that, the, and, and the difference is the large language model potentially, although extremely rarely compared to what people think, uh, can hallucinate something out of its training data, right? <laughs> it could predict that the next word should be the exact next word from its training data. So your Reddit post could come out of a large language model. If you're not using the API for training, that is not going to happen because, well, I mean, I guess it could happen by accident, but it is less, even, even less likely to happen. What right. will happen is the large language model may answer a question with, hey, there was actually a Reddit thread about this. Here's the link to it, right? Because it can scan and identify Got stuff, yeah, even yeah, if yeah. it's not been trained on it. Right. So even if the information is, you know, inaccurate or otherwise just not what you were looking for, that's going back to Reddit itself. Yeah, yeah. And then you're it's it's citations versus spitting out as if the the language model knew it. Yeah. Uh, also, some new features come in to folks who pay for ChatGPT or any of OpenAI's enterprise or business services. Paid users will get the ability to create tables and charts from uploaded documents. Uh, and then you can like highlight parts of those documents and ask the chatbot, you know, oh, can you can you change this? Can you make a table out of that? Uh, once you've got it in a table or chart that you're happy with, you can then download it and use it for your presentation. Going right along with that. Uh, uh, OpenAI is now integrating with both Microsoft OneDrive and Google Drive. So if you have a document in one of those drives, it'll be easy to get it into the tool and start playing around with it. Um, th this seems eminently practical and usable, right? Sure. Patrick, <laughs> no, you don't. You don't. This this one seemed like less controversial. No, I, I, and, and I heard no, I, you earlier. You were like, I, I, Ooh. yeah, no. And, and honestly, as as somebody who was working on a rather large chart recently, I I think I I think this is a case where I would have trusted AI to put it together, and then I would have gone over every. And you can scan document. it over. Yeah, sure. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I I've had I've been having some the Google AI search summaries has yielded some hysterical results. All I'm going to say about that right now. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I'm, this is definitely one I could see me using, like no, like a pra it's very, practical. It's very useful. practical. Some of the summaries people have been doing with it, or you know, like read these three thousand pages and tell me what they're about. I think that's something that it happens to have some talent for. Um, I just the more granular it gets, the more uptight I get about about some of the AI tools I've played with, making rather egregious. Uh, mistakes. So yeah, yeah, I, I get what you're saying, and I've had that same experience. Uh, the idea of being able to say, uh, "Here's all of Subrilliant LLC's income from Patreon, Acast, etc." put it in a chart for me and it does it, right. I'll be easily be able to tell if it messed it up. Uh, but it take, took the tedium out of me having to do that. Now, granted, there it's is, not that hard to do it in Excel, but this could be, you know, 
half yeah. the time. There's no joy to data entering in Excel and yeah, launching yeah. in a formula to map it to a spreadsheet or to a chart. I mean, I get it's, I get it. You yeah, know, I feel like this is we're we're in the 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 part of you know AI for productivity. This is going to make mm -hmm. everything easier for us, and we're all like, yeah, that sounds great in theory. It's almost like hiring an assistant who you're like, can you do some of this stuff for me? And they're like, hundred percent. But you're like, but I don't trust you. <laughs> yeah, it's so, an intern. So it's do intern it, level. and then yeah. I'm just gonna look over all your work and like, am I really saving time? Right. I mean, maybe you're saving. Oh, that's so a, good. Yeah. The kind of time that you want to save, right. but the, we're kind of in that point. Have Bob do that. Well, the last time Bob do that, I spent 23 hours undoing Bob's work. <laughs> yeah. Well, or or the intern, right? And then once the yeah. once you learn to trust the intern, you're like, oh, let me give the intern more work. And then the intern gets hired. Uh, and then the intern yeah. hey, kills hey. you. <laughs> Well, well, two very different that's a very terminator uh look at this uh, I don't know. So speaking of that of yeah. the team that was going to try to stop that from happen has been disbanded Ilya sutskever and jan and jan leaky of uh the super alignment team at open ai uh were preparing for the rise of artificial generalized intelligence that's when ai can just do a things on its own without us having to set the boundaries both of those people you probably heard earlier this week on DTNS or elsewhere announced departures from an open AI. They were leading that super alignment team and it has now been disbanded because they're gone. Most of the other people on it had either retired or been reassigned to other departments. Um, d does this show that the threat maybe was not as imminent as some thought or is open AI being irresponsible, Patrick? Oh uh, boy, <laughs> where do I start? I think it's I think it's interesting and kind of disturbing that all of these people left around this time. You know, this is some of the some of the more tinfoil hat responses to this have been, oh, "What did he see that made him leave? Why did he go? Why isn't he telling us it must be the NDA?" You know, and on the other hand, you know, there's been complaints like, "Well, we aren't getting the computer time we need. We can't do what we want to do." You know, there's a part of me that looks at this and go, you know, of all the things I'm worried about, I'm not entirely worried about Skynet coming out of a large language model, which is essentially a super sophisticated world word guessing tool. It's not like I'm playing Scrabble for the fate of, you know, human existence um, with an AI, but, I, you know, I'll also flat out say I'm not entirely sure you know, I mean, from a business standpoint, yes, we should have a group that makes sure our AI development, our generalized intelligence development, do not do something that will destroy humanity because that's bad for the stock price. Um, I'm just not entirely sure I trust any private company to do that at this point. And maybe that's yeah. what Scootscover is going to do, right? Yeah. I feel like if he saw something, he would have stayed. Uh, I I feel like or what he was working on was so far out from what's possible that OpenAI tolerated it because he was one of the co-founders, but sure. maybe isn't so regretful that he moved on. At this point. I feel like uh, in uh, five to 10 years, and maybe I'm looking out even too far, uh, all AI companies are going to have something like a super alignment team <laughs> that the government says, you must do this to protect humanity. Um, what it seems like happened at OpenAI was there were a lot of really smart people doing a lot of, you know, you know, break things, think about it later type uh, stuff. And uh, Sutskever and Leakey uh, leaving the super alignment team. And from what it sounds like, that team just kind of not existing anymore. OpenAI does not feel like that is a short term thing that it needs to have. Long term, yeah. you might. It, it feels like somebody working on airbags with horse and buggies because someday they'll go fast enough that we'll need them. Right. And yeah, but, and, but when? and we will. And yeah, when? exactly. Yeah. But so it, you've got yeah, all maybe, these people being like, you know right. what, we'll, we'll bring you on back when we need yeah. it. I actually would love it if Sutskiver started like a, an independent nonprofit organization, industry standard, pull people from multiple places and, and worked on this in advance. Now, I think that'd be great. Like a multidisciplinary, multi-company approach would be pretty awesome. Um, well, we're going to have to pour out a little liquor uh, for something else. Uh, so Korean do. news outlet Chosen reports that LG no longer making the signature OLED R TV. That's the one that rolls down and hides within a stand. 
with LG said to already be repurposing that manufacturing line for other TVs at a plant in at the Gumi plant in Gyeongbuk, South Korea. Now, if you're saying, what is this LG model? Is it the one that's transparent? No, no, no. It, it was originally shown off at CES at a prototype as a prototype back in 2019. Technically, CES 2018, but it was 2019. Didn't actually go on sale until a couple years later in 2021. It was a hundred thousand dollars, and that was for a 65 inch 4K TV that needed to rise in and out of a table of sorts, kind of a, a sort of a very very small coffee table type thing, like a hope chest. <laughs> But you couldn't chest. actually store it <laughs> yeah, inside of you it. Know, it, it. With the right room. You hoped it, it would unscroll it and you'd be able to cool. watch TV. Yeah. That's the one. But TV options have obviously changed since then. So uh, I don't know, Patrick. I, I felt like if you know, if if you if you hold a candle for the OLED RTV, you know, what, not, what do you I, think I, about this? I, I this feels like a technology demo that was made into a product because it would get a whole bunch of coverage from CES attendees, which it did. Which um, it did. I think yeah. it was supposed to sell for eighty five grand. As you pointed out, Sarah, it's it sold for like a hundred thousand dollars, you know. It's uh, it was fascinating. It was fun to watch. It was, you know, given that you could probably get a world class custom made, you know, enclosure and have your 65 inch television rise out of it and then disappear back inside of it um, because there's a whole zillion there's, you know, there's there's physical me mechanisms you can put inside of custom furniture. There are pre made furniture items that are designed to do that. You've seen them in a hotel room, Sarah. It was just one of those products where it's like, sure several people bought these but it was well never yeah and when i market. first saw this um as again a concept device at ces i was like huh you know i saw a tv that could rise in and out um of you know at the foot of a bed in a hotel room i stayed in for work right way back in the day this was not rollable um mm. it was not even particularly like i mean i don't even think we were at like hd lo levels at this point <laughs> but i was like this is kind of cool i can see this as a hotel room thing you right. know maybe here and there someone's personal you know bedroom There's, or uh, you know house but it didn't seem to catch on there, i mean there's there's a lot of parts in the room where you know or, or a lot of parts of the world where people's personal space or their apartments are significantly smaller than what people think of as normal in the united states right so there's a lot of clever furniture there's a lot of combined furniture there's a lot of stuff that we don't run into a lot here but even in those places like it's just the price it was it was a really slick like look we have screens that roll up and now we have phones with screens that fold and we have laptops with screens that fold and they have you know they're doing some slick things with applying this you know this these bendable surfaces and all sorts of display environments. Uh, I just feel like this it, this did its job. It, it made a whole lot of coverage and a whole lot of like, wow, look what they did. And, and now it's, they sold several of them and now it's time to just make it go away. <laughs> well, and what, what becomes of this, right? Like, I never thought the scrollable $100,000 TV was the future of a rollable screen. Uh, and I don't think LG did either. This was a right. way to try it out, get it out there in the world and, and maybe find out what's wrong with it uh, and, and, and how it works. I wouldn't be surprised to see LG come back with cheaper, smaller rollable screens at mm -hmm. CES next year saying, hey, you know, we had the big impressive thing for a few years. Guess what? We've learned and we've adapted and we moved it to a different factory. That's why it's not being made in that model anymore. But it we've we're putting it in other stuff. I mean, it would be super fun to have like a 17, 20, 24 inch television that, you know, you you pulled it open like you're opening a scroll and then it slides back into itself. And, yeah. it, you know, and you or for, for small apartments it. where you can just sure. like, you know, you don't have to spend a hundred thousand dollars and have a huge TV. You have, you have a smaller one that you just roll down from, from above. Well, and that's the whole thing about, you know, concept stuff that you right. see at places like CES where you sort of like head scratch, like, could I use this in my house? Not for a hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> but I mean, but, but, but could, you know, it, yeah, let's, yeah. let's talk about this, like uh, down the road, once, you know, technology gets cheaper, it sounds like LG said uh, art exhibitions, um, certain marketing efforts, <laughs> you know, the Google IOs of the world, for example, like, right. you know, companies who have some money to spend to have cool stuff, 
they could certainly, you know, uh, make, make this make this work. I think the the I am wealthy, I have room in my house, or for whatever reason, this works totally well on that wall. Uh, not so much. Yeah, sure. I actually saw somebody who has I can't remember if it was Samsung or LGs, but it was a vlogger who has the rollable TV that can turn mm -hmm. vertical. Uh, and you can mm -hmm. roll it around because they have a small apartment and they're like, sometimes I don't want to sit in bed and watch it. Sometimes I want to sit on the couch. So I just roll it back and forth. And I was like, oh yeah, I never really understood how that would work for me, but I get in that situation what right. it works for. Yeah. Um, well, if you were like, gosh, when Tom said that Korean word at the top of the show, he almost pronounced it correctly. How did he learn that? Well, I've got a top five for you. I break down the top five apps for learning another language uh, that I've been using. Uh, they apply to all kinds of languages, uh, not just the one I'm learning. So if you want to check that out, it's 60 seconds. You can watch it at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, DTNS Picks, DTNS PIX on Instagram, and of course at youtube.com slash Daily Tech News new show. Laptop computers introduced us to the two and a half inch hard drive form factor for solid state drives and NVMe solid state drives have supplanted them in most of the market. But the two and a half inch hard drive is not gone yet. Western Digital introduced a new six terabyte external hard drive, which will go into the company's My Passport, Black P10, and G Drive Armor ATD product lines. The drives are thicker than 15 millimeters of the current five terabyte, two and a half inch models, meaning they won't fit into the existing laptop drive bays. So the drives are right now available at retailers as external drives. They range in price from $200 for the WD my Passport Ultra up to $230 for the SanDisk Professional G Drive Armor ATD. Uh, Patrick, what's the significance of this? Because I've seen different takes on, you know, for the first time in six years, getting a new two and a half inch hard right. drive capacity. You know, I was laughing because depending on which story you read, it was it either took six, seven, or eight years to get to these six terabyte, two point five inch drives, um, and it's it's a weird market, right? Two two and a half inch drives, they basically fit in existing drive bays and very old laptops. There's a small community of of NAS devices, most of which are targeted at people who will put SSDs into them, um, you know. But as you pointed out, right, laptop manufacturer they've moved towards soldering storage directly onto the motherboard, the mainboard, or using M.2 SSD storage. Storage, um, you know, those little tiny expansion cards. So the demand for 2.5 inch drops, uh, drives has basically just, they're gone, right? Where they still exist, where they still sell a lot of units is in portable storage. Um, but even there, SSDs have replaced most of your classic rotating hard drives. Um, you know, other than the massive drives used for like NAS servers or desktop storage, see Roger's two cents for this week. Um, pretty much the entire market is about SSDs. And when you look at it right now, the sweet spot for a lot of portable storage is a, like a one terabyte SSD for under a hundred bucks. So I started digging around because this is one of those areas where you used to see them a lot and you don't see them as much anymore. So I got into the Micro Center's website. I found five two and a half inch traditional rotating media internal hard drives from one to two terabytes for like 52 to $99. And I was laughing because A, there are at least two computers in my home that are like all in ones and the secondary storage for those, these are a few years old and the secondary storage for those is a one terabyte, 2.5 inch rotating media SSD, which of course, you know, when my youngest was using his, he'd be like, why does it take so long to save out <laughs> files on the big drive? And I'm like, well, it's because, and then you explain the whole Winchester oh, hard kid, drive. You don't know how good you have it. <laughs> <laughs> You're so ready to be a parent, Sarah. <laughs> um, no, I'm just sort of like the crotchety aunt. <laughs> That's perfect. Get on out of here. You I need a phone that. number. I'm going to have him call you tonight. <laughs> um, so, but you know, there were 25 external two and a half inch drives with your, you know, old school rotating media, starting at like 65 bucks for one terabyte, maxing at 130 bucks for five terabytes. The previous largest, you know, two and a half inch drive, and then there were. 47 external SSDs in all mm -hmm. sorts of weird form factors, um, starting at 46 bucks for a 500 gigabyte drive, about 75 bucks for a one terabyte drive, four terabyte drives are now four terabyte external SSD drives are now under $200. And the max is like an eight terabyte Samsung T5 for $619. So, you know, to put that into context, a 20 terabyte hard drive for your NAS or your massive collection of photos in your desktop PC, which I know you're backing up somewhere else right 
because you're smart. Uh, those are all running like $300 to $450, depending on how consumer they are or how sort of helium filled and enterprise grade they are. Um, so when you're, when you're looking at, at large honking portable storage on a single drive, um, that's pretty much where two and a half inch drives still compete. You know, a four terabyte SSD, um, you know, they get more expensive, right? Some of them are $200, more reputable brands or brands are closer to $300, um, you know, and they're kind of rare. Uh, and anything bigger is going to cost you three times as much as an old school rotating media hard drive. So I think this is one of those things that is slowly. Fading yeah. Away. The gap is closing, <laughs> you yeah. know, six terabytes keeps it just a little more affordable than the solid state drive for your externals. But yeah, soon we'll be saying you goodbye. Know. Uh, but if you're moving large files, like, would you rather have two one terabyte drives moving data way faster or one big six terabyte? Well, I guess that would be six terabytes rather than two It's terabytes. almost cold storage <laughs> when, you, in, when you think of it that way. I recently had like an eight terabyte drive on somebody's computer I had to back the data off of. And it was just one of those things. It's like, I started the copy and they're like, when's it going to be done? I'm like, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go take a, a day trip we'll be yeah. back it'll be done yeah let's go drive to columbia to tgi friday stay the and night yeah you back. can get back just in time it's perfect that's a little pre-show humor <laughs> all right let's check out the mailbag we got a good one from laurent uh in what finally feels like winter is over montreal who wrote in on wednesday's show you had a question about llm model context windows here's what i use in my training to explain that concept Think of the credits at the end of a movie. As the credits roll, they disappear off the screen, never to be seen again. You could rewind, but that's a whole other story. Conversations with an LLM are similar. The credits are the content of the conversation. The screen is the context window. The larger the context window, so a taller screen, the more information the LLM can retain before forgetting the beginning of the conversation. Nice. Yeah, so yeah. It, it doesn't actually work this way, but if you if you had more credits on the IMAX screen, right, in, in right. a place where you can't pause and rewind, uh -huh. uh, that's a bigger context window than than the regular screen. That that makes perfect sense. I love this. This is a this is a good analogy. Thank you, Laurent. Indeed. All right, let's check in with our own large Len model, Len Peralta, to find out what he has been drawing today. Uh, and I mean large in personality, of course. Len, <laughs> Thank you so much for that. <laughs> clarification, Tom. Um, yeah, you know, I decided to go, I, I don't usually do this, but I decided to go back to the quick hits um, because I haven't mm -hmm. drawn Twitter in a while. Oh, uh, yeah, it's one and of your faves, I know. It's one of my faves. Uh, actually, it's, it's, it's just in the news a lot. So uh, what I decided to do is, um, is oh, do a little bit. Oh. This is called fare, <laughs> so Farewell sad. Tweet. Yes, it's X is done. Oh. And the X, With X the is X up. as the I, as, it, uh, as the little Twitter bird lays in to rest. The sad little rose. Do, do we know what the Twitter bird, like what kind of bird it was? Because maybe we could it's eat like it. It's like a little bluebird. It was a bluebird. No, it was a little bluebird. Literally. Yeah, I mean, it was blue. Did you say Yes, that image. Is I'm just saying, sad. you know, yeah, I'm know. trying to be sustainable. <laughs> yeah, okay? Lark's tongues. It's all about there you Lark's go. Tongues. There you go. Um, if you are interested, if you're a Twitter fan or an ex Twitter fan, if you will, and you'd like that image, you can go to my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len, and you can uh, back me at the DTNS lover level and get it immediately. Or you can go to my online store, lenperaltastore.com, and you can purchase that along with maybe even commissioning me for something because there's Father's Day, graduations, yeah, all kinds yeah. of things coming up. So uh, give it a thought. Perfect graduation day present is a commissioned piece of art from Len Peralta for your That's loved one. Absolutely Think about true. it. Absolutely. Len, beautiful work as always. Patrick Norton, beautiful work from you as well. Let Thank folks so know much. where they can keep up with you when you're not with us. Well, I am currently on the Twitters at Patrick Norton. Excuse me, the X at Patrick Norton. And if you think there's someplace else I should be getting my social on, do me a favor, tweet at me or uh, X at you. Or X post, at me. Post at you, I guess. Post yeah. at God. me. See, also, all, all these terms just got weird. 
creative designer Douglas Bowman says the Twitter bird is based on a mountain bluebird. Mountain blue. So it is a bluebird. I was just joking, but okay. Good to know. Mountain blue. Uh, that's the kind of fun stuff you might learn in one of our quizzes one Friday. Uh, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. It's Friday, and our quiz this week is about Google I.O. What I, I mean, why else? It's Google I.O. week. We're going to test our knowledge about Google I.O. Can you figure out the correct answer before we do? Stick around and find out. Just a reminder, y'all know it, but you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back on Monday discussing Microsoft's Build AI and Surface event with Chris Ashley joining us. Have a great weekend. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host, Rob Dunwood. Video producer, Joe Kuntz. Producer at large, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Our contributors this week were Justin Robert Young, Scott Johnson, Jason Howell, Chris Christensen, and Patrick Norton. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. End of context window. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>